försöker förstå mig på. Ja, det är därför det är Welcome everyone, please take your seats. The web streaming is starting half past, so please take your seats because this is also webcasted live at the internet. So I kindly ask you to sit down. On the left hand side in your chair, when you open the lid of the handler, there is a microphone for the questions when there's a time for audience questions you can all open it from the left hand side to see what is what is hidden some presents there for you The conference will be held in English, but there's uh, one speech uh, which will be interpreted. Well, there will be simultaneous interpretation at uh, 14, at 13:40, uh, so 20 to 2, and you can use the headset during that uh, speech if you don't speak Slovakian. Um, the channel one is for English, channel two is for Slovakian. And at the same handler, there's also a microphone for your questions if you want to make uh, during the discussion. Okay. Uh, welcome again. Distinguished participants, welcome to Think Forest, the last Think Forest event of the year, where we will summarize some of the findings of our science to policy reports that we have been producing since COP21 in Paris. And also we will present a new study that we have just uh, launched today. And it will be nice also to get some new ideas about future studies that we can develop in the coming year. Let me thank Mrs. Mia Petra Kumpulanatri, member of the European Parliament, for hosting today's Think Forest event. And of course, our president, Mr. Parson, to be with all of us today once more. The topic of today is about the bioeconomy. It has been one of the core elements of Think Forest activities in the last years. And I would like to briefly reflect with all of you about the topic. Bioeconomy is more than just an industrial sector that utilize, utilizes and transforms biomass or biological resources. I think in our view, bioeconomy is an opportunity, an opportunity to transform our economy so that it prospers within the renewable boundaries of our planet, according to the principles of sustainability, resource efficiency, and inclusiveness. And let's not forget our inclusiveness in a moment of of our history where inequality issues have demonstrated in the US elections or in Brexit be more important than ever. I think the bioeconomy offers quite an important opportunities in delivering inclusive growth 
integrating the rural territories. And this is very much related to the inherent characteristics, availability, and distribution of biomass and biological resources, which is quite different from the distribution availability of fossil resources. So these characteristics, distribution and availability, which could be seen as a challenge in terms of transportation and the scale of the facilities to process biomass, also offer an opportunity in redistributing jobs in rural territories and redistributing, redistributing wealth. And let's not forget also that the bioeconomy is not only about rural areas. There will be mo plenty of opportunities in providing green jobs in developing a new generation of climate smart cities, involving the role of wood construction in cities and a more strategic role for forests and trees in making cities more adapted to climate change. Francis Fukuyama mentioned 27 years ago that it was the end of history. We have realized these days that history is very stubborn and comes back in the form of different faces and different flavors. I don't know if it was the end of history. What is clear, and I would like to finish with a quotation of uh, Bobby Kennedy, is that the future is not a gift, the future is an achievement. So let's work towards the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you everyone for attending this um, timely seminar on, on the issues as we are all eagerly waiting for the new proposals to be then uh, worked in, in the parliament and the member states and then would, that would of course affect all the players on the field who will use forest for something. Uh, and I must say that I can't uh, have a day without Paris Agreement and even now after the US elections it's even more important that we do have some light going on that we will see the a light in the end of the tunnel that there will be a target, there will be goals where we want to go uh, and, and make this globe to survive in the future and for our children. So then uh, having all this in mind, we have a Paris, we have the energy union, we have the, then inside the renewables, we will have the circular economy that how much the globe can do right. And then of course we are still in the economical phase that we need to actively look for the new jobs and, and innovations. So I hope that whatever will be the commission proposal soon and what will be the future years on the bioeconomy, we will not take just one aspect, but we will look at it as a broader aspect as we have several political goals that we need to uh, fulfill also. Uh, I'm very curious of today's seminar as it's not only internal EU, we have a visitor also from outside and I must say the greetings that I used my Green Week visiting the United States. So yes, there was something else than the uh, election going on only as I with a colleague uh, um, we visited the southern forests and then there, it was really interesting to see their perspective. They sent the people from the uh, federal government, the local Virginian government to really to see that uh, and uh, show how they think of the forest. And then uh, the forest there, the, the ones we visited were several types, but it, it has been the forest that has been the lowland crop forests that have been regularly harvested over the three centuries. And then uh, the, it's, it, I was not, of course, so proud that only less than 20% was certified forest, but then me meeting and talking with people, so they had different uh, aims also. So it was, of course, it was the uh, source for resources uh, but it, uh, and raw material, but it was uh, family owned some of them so it was the aesthetics of their own lands it was the avoid the erosion and they could see that what has been the mistake in some part and how to include that for the next uh, turnaround for the, the, the new trees providing habitat for the gams and it was also the uh, hunting on the same forests and then it was the return of the wood itself was that inevitable there. There were some f old former fields that if you did not continue you had the forest to come place. So then it, it, it is also very interesting to, to see the different parts of the world as with some rules we need must be uh, uh, international and global. But I also look forward to Europe that 
provides for the new innovations on bioeconomy. We need uh, uh, new biofining technologies to sustainably transform renewable resources, nature resources, into the bio-based products, materials, and even fuels. So EU has the industrial resource and renewable resources to remain the global pivot for the prospering bioeconomy. If we then can do it on the sustainable way, which is possible if we do it on the smart way, that will also to create the public acceptance that is needed. Because most of the consumers still are interesting and then more and more so in the future. So then I hope for the good uh, criteria that we will see uh, how the bioeconomy can boost the economy. Bioeconomy can uh, be a solution for the, the global uh, climate, but then also for the uh, circular economy needs that we will have, and then be our own habitat. I'm from the Sami people myself, from very northern Finland, my roots, and I think still that it's something mystic in this thinking, and, and it must be partly true that we are part of the nature as human beings too. So on my behalf, I'm very happy to host all you and then the great speakers we have on the list. I hope we have, have fruitful discussions and even today. Thank you on my behalf. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mia Petra, for your intervention and hosting us today. Thank you very much. Um, it's a dramatic political time. And uh, we could, of course, spend a lot of time discussing the, the situation just now. We, we shall not do that. But just a short reflection. Um, we don't know anything about the incoming policy of the United States. It is completely impossible, after having followed the election campaign, to make any conclusions about what will happen. And um, therefore, uh, I, I, I stick to um, an uh, analysis that is based more upon how politicians behave when they are elected. You see, being elected, almost everyone can be. Just take a look around the world and you will see that. Uh, re-elected, that is the art of politics. Being re-elected once or twice or three times and the first thing an elected politician reflect upon the first day on the job, so to say, is how can I become re-elected? And um, Mr. Trump, for instance, he has to ask himself, if I uh, carry through what I have promised in the election campaign, will I then be re-elected? Definitely not. If I don't deliver what I have promised, will I then be re-elected? Probably not. So he has those two options. And I think he stick to the probably option. <laughs> and uh, therefore you have in front of you a debate about what he said and what he will deliver. When it comes to the climate agreement in Paris last year, he has been very blunt and outspoken. But if he wants to make America great again, he can't turn the climate change issue the back. Because there you will have the main driving force for research and development and economic development in the future. And if US want to leave that to other giants around the world to take the lead, they are free to do so. But then be sure they will not be great again. That is as I read the situation. And we have seen it before, a very negative US Congress. But nevertheless, the state of California, for instance, taking the lead in the world regarding how to develop the transport sector in an environmentally and safe way. And you have the best educated, the most brilliant researchers and scientific centers, universities on that side of the Atlantic, and you have the capital, and you have the need for new products, I guess that this will be in the center also of the next US administration. I'm more worried about the European situation, 
after the discussion about Brexit. You don't know where that will end up. How we continue to, so to say, keep the European Union together with different kinds of uh, relations to the European Union, but in the end, the same interest to cooperate in Europe. How will that look like? And we have our field, the bioeconomy, in front of us. How much is it up to the Commission to interfere or to take initiatives? How much is it up to the individual member countries to take the lead? And how will you find the balance in that process? If you don't do so, if you don't find the balance, you will have more countries starting to argue about the problems with Brussels. And you will have more discussions like the one we have seen in UK. And perhaps there will also be those who will be able to quote Mr. Trump and talk about Brussels as he talked about Washington. So we have to be careful. We have to take care of the European Union. It is our best asset, but we have to see that it has a popular support, and the popular support it will gain if it will go for a policy that will underpin a bioeconomy development that supports the climate change, the climate change activities. That is the core of today's seminar, and that is the political background or the framework as I look upon it. Welcome. And now we have Slovakia as responsible for the development inside the European Union. I have myself held the presidency in the European Union many years ago. It was my best half year in my political career, I can assure you. It is, it is a fantastic moment. So therefore, to our Slovakian friend, good luck. We trust you. Welcome to deliver your statement, sir. And the one who does so is Anton Stredak, Deputy Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development of the Slovak Republic. Please. Thank you for the floor. Dear ladies, dear gentlemen, I very much appreciate the opportunity to open the workshop of the Think Forest Forum dedicated to the topic of building an innovative and resilient bioeconomy, bio which is for the current period more than topical. We live a period of unforeseeable global challenges such as climate changes, water scarcity, food and energy security and loss of biodiversity. All of these aspects lead to shifting of the economy based on fossil fuels to bioeconomy. The forest, one of the best ecosystems, has an enormous potential for bioeconomy as it can ensure the possibility of substituting the fossil unsustainable resources by renewable materials. The forest provides for valuable products, services, and it has a positive effect on the strategic resources for keeping life on this planet, such as air, water, soil, and biodiversity. Forestry represents uh, an essential component of bioeconomy as well as a significant resource of the renewable material wood. In this connection, let me highlight the fact that contrary to many other regions of the world, the European region managed to establish many different functional mechanisms for ensuring sustainable forestry management long time ago. Through active forest management, the EU member states have already for decades provided for economic, social, as well as environmental functions of forests, which are beneficial for the whole community. In the European region, the volume of traded round wood amounts to 18 billion euro, and this value continues to grow. On the other hand, it must be noted that the annual amount of 
cut timber is lower than the annual wood increment. In the European region, the increment prevails over the production by 30%. In the Slovak Republic, the timber production represents an average of 60% of the increment, and what is important, it even does not exceed the increment in the periods of natural disasters. The forest offers opportunities for employment, income, as well as the material for traditional and innovative industries. It offers many non-timber products and services mainly at the local level, where it is possible to trade uh, forest plants, uh, farming, as well as game products. The forest, however, also performs other functions which are usually not traded, such as protective function, function of preserving the biodiversity, and naturally also the recreational one. The forest ecosystem services, which are not traded in forests, contribute significantly to bioeconomy through regulation of the water regime, infrastructure protection, as well as protection of soil from water and wind erosion and rock slides. In consideration of the ecosystem services and the assessment of priorities in meeting the forest functions in our country, we classify our forests as follows. There are economic forests, which ensure especially the economic function in 72%, forests with protective roles designed first of all for protection of soil and water, 17% of them, and forests for special purposes, which meet especially the functions of biodiversity protection, recreational functions, scientific and research functions, and last but not least, also hunting ones, making up for about 11%. Management of all the forests in Slovakia is governed by forest management plans, which amply cover the forest functions and which are provided for, and I wish to highlight this, to all of the forest owners by the government. The forests cover about 40% of the territory of our country, which is more than 2 million of hectares of forest land. The forest area's biodiversity of Slovakia is very high. This is evidenced also by the fact that due to overlapping of different types of protected areas, in Slovakia we have approximately by 1 million hectares more of such areas than is the actual size of the forest area. In the context of possibilities available for bioeconomy in the forestry management, there are being organized various events. One of such events was also the Bratislava Bioeconomy Conference that took place on the 16th October 2016. The conference was also dedicated to the topic of the contribution of forest regions to bioeconomy. On the example of Finland, in the area of North Karelia, they were presented practices applied in implementing the bioeconomy strategy in forestry. It was highlighted uh, the tasks of the local authorities, industry, science and research, as well as primary wood producers. Due to the a vast number of possibilities offered by forests for bioeconomy, it is necessary to create mechanisms that will support forest owners in their efforts to promote their sustainable management. I believe that this workshop will show the possibilities for building an innovative and resilient bioeconomy and thus help the politicians in their efforts of identifying the best solutions. In this connection, let me also draw your attention to the Bratislava Declaration, which was adopted at the informal meeting of the EU General Directors in charge of the forestry, held on the 8th of November 2016 in Bratislava. Bratislava Declaration emphasizes inevitability of ensuring economic viability of forest entities in pushing through the principles of sustainable development in practical management of forests. Furthermore, it also accentuated the obligation of science, research and innovation in implementing the EU strategy for forests. It highlights uh, the interest of the EU member states, owners of forests, processors, in enhancing the position of the European Union in promoting sustainable management in forestry on an international basis, including its foreign policy. 
In this context, the declaration calls for early commencement of the preparatory process of the EU in respect to the expected intergovernmental discussions concerning the possible pan-European legally binding agreement for forests. Thank you for your attention. Mr. Stredak, Deputy Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development of the Slovak Republic. Thank you very much. Now, Laura Hettemeke has asked for the floor. Ah, okay. okay. Mr. Chairman, dear seminar audience, I will steal 15 minutes of your time by sharing some of the insights from recent EFI studies. I will cover. This is not Mr. Kai. You have realized something. <laughs> he will arrive, but a little bit late. So uh, this is Mr. Hetemäki. Uh, I said the but same. still a Finn. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I will cover the insights from three different studies. Uh, one, which you see on the left on the slide is about the demand of forest products and the structural changes that are happening in the European Union markets as regards to forest products. The second study is about how uh, European forest and forest-based sector can help to mitigate climate change. And the third one, a very recent one from the last month, is about bioenergy in a climate change situation. Already, the previous speaker were referring some of the major facts about the European forest sector. So about 37% of the land area is covered by forests. Uh, the forest sector helps to mitigate around 13% of uh, the CO2 emissions in EU area today. Uh, the forest-based uh, energy is almost 50% of the renewable energy in, in Europe. It was also mentioned that for the biodiversity purposes, for water production, for soil conditions, forests play a really important role. I would also like to flag some of the importance, economic importance of uh, traditional forest sector. If you just consider the paper industry and the wood products industry, that have been there already for 100 years, and you ask yourself, what is the economic impact of these sectors today in EU? Uh, the industry turnover annually is about 300 billion euros, which is equal to the amount of three giant European companies listed in that slide. Similarly, uh, the employment figures, 1.5 million, is, is big. And here I have only counted the traditional forest sector. For example, DG growth, when they discuss about forest-based sector, they also include the value-added sector and forestry, and those numbers could easily double if I had included them. So the message is that it is important in terms of economy already today. The current situation in the EU forest-based sector, I have described it as creative destruction. Creative destruction is a term coined by Austrian-American uh, economist Joseph Schumpeter in the 1940s. It's a typical feature of uh, market economy. You continuously have some economic sectors, industries that are vanishing and new emerging. But at the forest-based sector in the European Union, this creative destruction is strongest that it has been for decades in our life. Just to take uh, examples, in that slide you have the production of paper and sawn wood in Europe. For the past 10 years you have observed the decline that we have not observed since the Second World War. A really big change. I would expect that the blue line describing the wood product sector will increase, but the red one will continue to decline. This situation is, of course, reflected in the wood markets. Here you have the roundwood production, industrial roundwood production in the European Union, 
in the past 55 years. Never in this history have we observed such a long decline and stagnation. Often we hear that the pie economy is creating a huge increase of uh, forest biomass. What we actually observe in the data is that in the past eight years it has declined. It has declined to the amount that Germany produces annually. If you added the imported wood, which is about 15% of the production, you, it would tell a similar story. We are consuming less wood raw material today in the European Union than in the past. These, what I call destructive drivers, have created the urge to create and renew the sector. And I will tell you three different examples of what is happening in this front, the creative front. And it is really outside the forest sector, what is happening outside the forest sector that will have an impact in the forest sector. In this graph, you see a history of dissolving pulp. Many of you who are now in this room are wearing uh, products that are based on dissolving pulp. Uh, textiles. And you see from that figure that there has been different phases in the uh, history of this uh, production. But in the, this century, for especially for two reasons, environmental reasons and food, it has again increased over five times during the last uh, 15 years. Environmental reasons uh, 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 wood-based fibers can substitute for fossil-based uh, fibers like polyester. On the other hand, cotton takes a lot of land from agriculture, especially in China and India, and needs a lot of water. Here, the wood-based fiber can substitute for cotton. Those two things are the major drivers that you see behind that uh, rapid increase. Another example that is mean, meaningful for urban population, construction. The technological innovation that we have observed in the wood construction sector enables us today to produce different kind of uh, wood buildings than in the past, especially the multi-story buildings. Uh, they are coming economically efficient and they are replacing, uh, for example, concrete uh, in, in many uh, multi-story buildings. And this is an increasing trend. Here you have three, uh, three main uh, advantages that are related to, for example, less primary energy is needed, less CO2 emissions, and more healthy living environment. There are many studies that are pointing out uh, the CO2 emission substitution impact of wood construction, and you will find lots of different uh, figures here I have quoted the figure from a meta-study meta that is uh, usually considered as uh, the most representative study. And if you replace one ton of uh, concrete by wood, that will decrease the CO2 emission by two, million to uh, two, uh, two tons. In the past eight years, we have observed the economic downturn in the European Union that we have never, ever experienced so long downturn. But that figure shows you that despite this economic downturn, the wood products and uh, dissolving pulp have increased, exactly because there is a huge demand to use them for fossil-based products, for example. And I think this is the case for many of the uh, bioeconomy products that you can derive from forest. Another example that is a very topical currently in Brussels uh, by energy. Uh, by energy, according to a very recent study that EFI published, cannot be separated from the forest sector other activities in most cases. Of course, you have exceptions, but in most cases, it's part of the forest management, forest products production, energy system, and it is very difficult to take the by energy part as a separate entity and only assess it as a separate entity. So that's the one outcome. It's part of the whole circular system and cascading system. If you look at the energy models or International Panel of Climate Change models, and you look how bioenergy is included in those, in all those scenarios where you are able to reach 
uh, the policy targets for climate mitigation by energy is part of those scenarios. And the study concludes that given the right type of a forest management uh, system, bioenergy is making uh, environmental and economic sense. Of course, there is a thousand different types of forest bioenergy. It's not one entity, so there are differences. Coming to the climate mitigation role of European Union forest and forest-based sector. Last December, we published a study how could European forest and uh, forest-based sector help to mitigate the climate change. I already said that about 13% of the emissions are mitigated by the forest-based sector today, the forest and the sector. Uh, the study is saying that this could be increased over 22%, but for that you need incentives, what they call climate smart forestry. And you need to be creating uh, synergies between, for example, bioeconomy and biodiversity. If I look at these three EFI studies and make an overall conclusion, the conclusion is that it could create, the forest-based bioeconomy could create much more sustainable growth in jobs and jobs, tackling environmental challenges in a better way and engaging the society. I'm an economist and I like this production possibility font here, describing uh, how the forest-based bioeconomy can produce ecosystem services and forest-based products. You could advance uh, bioeconomy by just increasing the x-axis, the products, and then even perhaps reducing the uh, y-axis, the ecosystem services. But I don't consider that as a sustainable. What we really need is to push the production possibility frontier upwards where you increase uh, ecosystem services together with the products find the synergies, minimize the trade-offs. But in order to reach that higher frontier, you need policies. First, you need a coherent and uh, well-coordinated policy framework. EU doesn't have a European forest policy, but it has many policies that are impacting the sector. There needs to be coordination between this sector and another sec uh, policy is not hurting the other sector regarding the forest sector. So there's a need to reinforce the coordination. There's also a need to address the market failures. I think today uh, the price of a ton of a CO2 emission is about six euros, a price of a hamburger. It's not a creating a lot of incentives to act and change the economy towards the buy economy. Clearly higher CO2 prices could advance the forest-based bioeconomy significantly. It's really important, like I said, to in increase the synergies and minimize the trade-offs. There will always be trade-offs within different societal uh, uh, objectives, but we can also find uh, ways to increase the synergies and minimize the trade-offs. Sustainability and resource efficiency are the must for the bioeconomy development. Uh, today we will hear about EFI study that addresses especially the sustainability issue. Finally, research and development, of course we need more. I'm a researcher, it's easy to think that I will say that. But we also need science-informed uh, policy, not policy-informed science. Thank you. Thank you, Lauri Hettemäki. And now, Mr. Jyrki Katainen, the commissioner has arrived. You are welcome. And I know you have short of time, so please take the floor immediately. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Honorable Chairman, I'm terribly sorry for being a bit late. I'm coming from the Agriculture Council, which was uh, running also a bit late, and that's why me and Phil Hogan uh, uh, needed to reschedule our day a bit. I very much like Lauri Hedemäki's uh, ending, so the policy should be driven by science and not the other way around. So it, is, it may sound funny, but uh, it is reality, and we in the Commission must remember this also. 
Thank you very much, uh, European Forest Institution, uh, Institute, for this opportunity to be here today, and thanks very much for organizing the event. I think we, generally speaking, we need more understanding on forest. Coming from the middle of the forest, uh, I sometimes uh, wonder how different is the views are amongst uh, the Europeans what forest is and how it can be used. So I think this is the main challenge we all face, and that's why these kind of events are very, very important. So with my background, I can say the active and sustainable use of Finnish forest is an excellent example of bioeconomy in action. I'm sure we all support the idea of using more of our renewable raw materials to replace the non-renewable ones. While share the same broader target, we have to carefully examine how to do this in reality to achieve most added value. When starting in my current position in responsible of um, jobs and growth and competitiveness, I said the modernization of the European economy as one of my main priorities. The world around us does change and we have to be able to change as well. One strand of change is that we are estimated to be around 9 billion people living on this planet in 2050. While today we are already using the resources of 1.6 planet Earth. So doing more with less is good. But we also have to do things differently. The, the other option is, to, is that we keep on going business as usual and the future generation will uh, bear the consequences. But what does the forest bioeconomy offer? How can it support the agenda of the European Union? I'm sure you will come up with several answers today, but let me just highlight a few areas of potential. One of, the, one of uh, them relates to climate as the climate change challenge is, a particular, is of particular importance uh, to the forest sector. In line with the objectives of uh, the Paris Agreement on climate change, the EU has committed to reduce its overall greenhouse gas emissions by at least 40% by 2030. The forest sector is not only expected to contribute to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and sequester carbon, but it's also under growing stress due to the changing climate to which it has to adapt. Being a major carbon sink, woody raw material and the forest sector play a key role in the development of low carbon and climate friendly economy that can provide important input towards reaching our goals. As a vice president responsible for jobs, growth and investment, I see that the forest-based bioeconomy could offer more potential for sustainable growth and new investments in the EU. Technical process progress uh, now allows the conversion of biomass into a broad range of products, ranging from food and feed to fuel and other novel developments such as textile, uh, cosmetics or bioplastics. By using more renewable raw materials within the boundaries of sustainability, of course, we can substitute the use of fossil resources. One good example comes from the sector of transport, where we are still around 95% dependent on fossil fuels. There we have great potential for biofuels and electric vehicles using renewable electricity. Climate change, modernizing the European economy, energy union are examples of highly complex issues to which there are no single solution. In this way, I do not suggest that our future low-carbon society would be solely based on the biomass from our forest, but it definitely can offer solution as part of the palette. It can offer consumers like you and me of the possibility to choose between increased amount of sustainably, sustainably reduced goods, uh, resource goods while improving our security of supply and providing new possibilities of growth in rural areas. Ladies and gentlemen, I just mentioned some of the possibilities seen for the forest-based bioeconomy. But as you know, it is not a new concept. The Commission adopted its bioeconomy strategy in 2012. 
Bio-based products are also taken up in the context of circular economy, where the Commission engages to promote efficient use of bio-based resources and support innova innovation in the bioeconomy. In the Circular Economy Action Plan, we also clearly state, state that, the, that the Commission will examine the contribution of its 2012 bioeconomy strategy to the circular economy and consider updating it if necessary. Even though not explicitly mentioned, bio-based products can also contribute to other circular economy priorities, such as construction and plastics. It is good to note that the EU already offers significant support for the bioeconomy. The Common Agricultural Policy provides support to the European, notably in relation to the provision of biomass from agriculture and forestry and its processing. For example, based on the current figures we have, forestry uh, measures under our rural development policy will receive 8.2 billion euros in total public fun funding for the period 2014-2020. Uh, Research and innovation are crucial for developing the forest-based bioeconomy. This year, we have a number of activities, uh, activities relevant to forest uh, under the European Innovation Partnership on agriculture, productivity and sustainability. There is a focus group on the sustainable mobilization of forest biomass and other uh, focus group on agroforestry as well as a workshop on new value chains from multifunctional forests. These activities can be followed up by further actions at regional and local level financed under rural de development programs. Other possibilities for research and innovation also exist under Horizon 2020, which provides funds to support the bio-based industries, public private partnerships, in which uh, forest-based value chains are an important part and the development of the forest-based bioeconomy. Financial instruments offer new opportunities to further support competitiveness and innovation in forestry and the bioeconomy in order to achieve the maximum impact from available public financial resources. At the same time, we are working to get more private investment in Europe. And I have been happy to see many bioeconomy related investments take off in my home country. I've been working hard developing the European Fund for Strategic Investment, EFSI, to offer additional funding possibilities, especially for uh, modern um, higher risk projects. With EFSI, our aim is also to increase blending of different sources of EU funding in order to maximize leverage effect and impact on jobs and growth. As the EFSI is designed especially for riskier projects, often related to new technologies, I would encourage you as well uh, to examine if it could offer possibilities to finance bioeconomy related projects. One good example of uh, such use of EFSI is the Metra Group bio-based investment in Anekoski in Finland. In addition, the EU forest strategy recognizes that forests and the forest sector are at the heart of progress towards a successful bioeconomy. It acknowledges that while there is not a common EU forest policy per se, the EU can contribute through its various policies to implementing sustainable forest management. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, advanced uh, wood-based materials and chemicals are expected to play a major role in the EU bioeconomy. So not only forest-based biomass, but also non-wood forest products, which are gaining market interest, provide opportunities to maintain and create jobs and diversify income in a low-carbon green economy. Therefore, I'd like to wish you a successful event and uh, encourage you to actively share with, your, uh, with the Commission your views on how the forest-based bioeconomy could support the agenda of this Commission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Katainen. And uh, now we have the opportunity to put questions both to Mr. Katainen and to Mr. Hettemäki. But as I said before, Mr. Katainen has uh, short of time, 
So we start with him. And I give you the floor if you want to put a question. Raise your hands and I will remind you it is questions, not interventions. <laughs> we are short of time. Okay. Is there any question to the Commissioner? Then I can put a question. Do you think, Mr. Katanen, that it is a good idea to have uh, different approaches for different countries inside the European Union because of uh, their um, tradition and their natural uh, uh, conditions? For instance, uh, if you compare Finland with uh, Greece, uh, how, how do you look upon that problem? <coughs> Thank you very much. As everybody knows, we don't have a European-wide forest policy. Um, and sometimes it's a, uh, it's a shortage, and sometimes it's just uh, recognizing the fact that uh, forest represents different values to different uh, parts of Europe. But what we should do, uh, we should have a common understanding on sustainability and common understanding the bio uh, economy, including forest, could play a significant role in our, uh, our economy as a whole. So uh, forest has a lot of different values, and this is also a fact which we have to recognize. But um, it's not fair or right that if you are, if, if, uh, uh, if the reality where people are living varies very much that you are looking at forest or bioeconomy only from your own perspective, even if your perspective would be suitable only for your own environment. Because, uh, as everybody knows, um, forest has some, um, uh, forests are totally different thing in different parts of Europe. So sustainability criteria is important, but also the recognition that um, our understanding is very difficult, and that's why we have to be very, um, uh, very open-minded when, when uh, regulating forest-related products. There are several countries where forests are maintained very well, and this is one of the reasons why forests are growing very fast. And forest management seems to be quite a new concept in, in EU uh, environment. So it hasn't been recognized as well as possible. And I partially understand this. If there's not forest in some countries, there's no forest management. But in the countries where forest is, uh, is taken, the majority of the landscape, then the forest management plays a, plays a role. And this is pr probably one of the good, good examples where we need mutual understanding. For instance, when addressing climate change uh, issues, the forest management plays a crucial role because it's the way to to, to strengthen capturing carbon. It's not only um, planting trees, but only managing existing trees and forest, so which matters. So I, I'm sure if you, if I uh, answer to your question, but this more or less, I, I think uh, um, things are at the moment. I uh, would like to raise one additional issue just to promoting EFSI. EFSI. Uh, it's, it's been one of my main job in, in this commission to promote or create and promote EFSI, the new fund. So um, even though there are good examples how private companies have used FC for bioeconomy, there is still a big, uh, big room for maneuver for the other players to play. We will extend FC in terms of time, but also in terms of firepower. So by 2020, European Investment Bank will have 100 billion resources to invest in uh, higher risk uh, new technology projects. And this is supposed to trigger around 500 billion additional investment. So FC is a perfect vehicle, for instance, to, to create new innovative projects from uh, wood. It's a perfect innovation fund uh, for bioeconomy. So uh, 
this is probably my main message today that uh, you are you are a stakeholders very familiar with forest and new innovations in bioeconomy just convey this message to your to your um, uh, friends in this sector that if there's a need for patient money risk sharing financing the only thing one has to know is the phone number of EIB in your own capital no need to send letters to, uh, to Luxembourg, but just to call to EIB's office in your own capital. So um, FC is offering something which is scarce resource in market. We don't want to replace private money. Instead, we want to guarantee part of the private investor risk and by doing so crowd in private liquidity. Mm -hmm. Okay, the lady. Okay. <laughs> yes, very good, very good question. Um, and we need a good answer. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure if we are going to create a sustainability criteria for for metal or, or plastic, but what we are doing at the moment is to to look at those materials from circular economy point of view. Circular economy is, or I consider bioeconomy as part of circular economy, but uh, it covers the other sectors also. For instance. Um, we have a single market for oil, but we don't have well-functioning single market for empty water bottles, which are made of oil. So oil can come easily from Netherlands to Belgium, but try to send an uh, empty water bottle back from Belgium to, to Netherlands, it's much more difficult because it's considered as a, wa as a waste. Same thing applies with most of the waste streams. So that's why the Commission tries to create um, European-wide uh, regulation on um, on waste, whatever it means, in order to circulate raw materials. Metals circulate quite well at the moment, but many other um, waste streams doesn't. Also, when it comes to bioeconomy, there are several waste streams coming out of uh, pulp factories, for instance, and sometimes those are very valuable waste uh, waste which could be used by other producers but because it's classified as a waste it's very difficult to use so that's why we need better european-wide single market regulation on waste streams because uh, otherwise uh, waste is waste it's not a valuable material anymore and and that's why we have to get rid of this so this is probably the main thing what we are doing in this field well, <clears throat> yes, uh, hello, uh, thank you for, for the message here. Uh, coming back to, to forest, uh, then I think there is an, a very important development recently which has to be addressed both in relation to research but also in relation to policy. And this is uh, the notion that uh, of course we would like to have these kind of cascading principles saying trees are growing and they are used and then at the end they are burned. But now increasingly uh, we have a development where the big power plants are now substituting coal in order to uh, to source from the forest directly. And uh, this is really a very important issue uh, because uh, there's a lot of discussions about it. There are a lot of discussions about the carbon depth, about, about these things, the sustainability of the whole process. Uh, and uh, I would urge uh, EFI to look even more, you have done it already, but maybe to look even more into this issue. But also, I think it's important to ask uh, the Commission how you are dealing with that now, because it's a multi-billion euro investment which the different power plants are doing now. They are moving into to pellets, uh, and they have also to know whether these kind of incentives will be continued in the future. 
so uh, I would like to ask you how the Commission are dealing with these issues uh, and how uh, are the, the industry able to, to, uh, to, to, to deal with that in the future? Thank you. Cascading principle is an uh, important principle in a sense that it concentrates on resource efficiency. But um, we cannot be orthodox in this. And that's why writing it to the legislation may lead to worse situations sometimes. I don't want to undermine uh, the importance of cascading principle, but um, if possible, it would be very good to, to use it in a very pragmatic manner. You described the problem quite well, and, and there is not a single or simple answer to, to what, what you asked, but uh, this is how we see that uh, cascading principle must be taken into account in, t in terms of improving resource efficiency, but we must be very cautious not to use it wrong way or orthodox manner, which will create other problems, or, or at least we will uh, lose lots of uh, potential in, in terms of growth and new innovations. Yeah. Okay, Here we have the man there, and I think we can take two more questions, at least, please. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Bernard de Galambert. I'm working for the Confederation of European Paper Industries, uh, which is one of the founding members of the European Bioeconomy Alliance as well. Um, you've mentioned, Mr. Commissioner, uh, and it's right, the, the ambitions of the EU to decarbonize by 80% by 2050, and I think that's a fantastic opportunity for the bioeconomy and for our sector in particular. Five years ago, our organization was releasing a roadmap where it was saying it would decarbonize its own sector or emissions by 80% while growing by 50%. And, and in a week from now, we will engage a new conversation about that, exploring what are the pathways. I'll come to that, but I need a bit of background. Uh, no, we don't have time with that. Give the question now. So shortly, uh, sh explore the pathways to get there. That's why I come to what you, I would say, your favorite hobby, which is FC. Um, We've seen, indeed, a limited uptake uh, of FC, in my opinion, from the bioeconomy sector. And I think several assessments have shown that it was not delivering as expected. What do you think is missing there? What makes it so that the sector has not really embraced the opportunity? You announced the 500 billions to come, which are a fantastic opportunity as well. But okay. how can we convince the sector yeah. to, to grab that and call, indeed, the EIB office nationally? We could take another uh, one more, and yeah, I could. Uh, I think so. Then uh, there are many, but we just okay. Sorry, but that's the situation. I'm with Boston with ICN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and as we know, the forest deliver a lot of services in many ways, from timber to environmental energy, and of course, all the ecosystem services. And my question is, as the environment. Yeah. is going into this natural capital accounting, and it is potentially the only way to have a fair game mm. between the mm. different amounts of forest. Yeah. Because there, there are no economic values with these other services, they will have a very tough time competing. So what mm. is the Commission planning to do that? Okay. Thank you very much. Questions. Yes. DG Envy is doing a good job on this. And it's, um, I'm coordinating Commissioner Vella uh, in his work, and that's why I, I think it's... Um, I compare sometimes uh, this exercise to, to reporting requirements of financial institutions where they have to report several things, for instance, food carbon print or uh, equality between the sexes in working in the company, etc. So it's raising the awareness of all the added value what in this time forests are offering. And I think it, uh, it's valuable exercise because uh, then we can uh, we don't need to look at um, uh, individual legislation like cascading issue if we have a broader picture what kind of value forest is uh, creating and then we can what uh, can decide consciously how to use forests sustainable manner how to get the most economic benefits out of it at the same time 
when we are um, preserving the other values with uh, what the forests are creating to, to, the, to the people. So it's uh, taken quite seriously in, in, in Commission, more generally speaking, but the work is uh, ongoing and we have to follow it. On EFSI, actually EFSI, generally speaking, functions very, very well, but because it's demand-driven fund, if some sector is not represented or it, if it has not used EFSI, it's um, mostly because of lack of awareness or lack of interest. Some projects can finance themselves without the support of EFSI, and that's fine. But I could imagine that bioeconomy and forest sector, more generally speaking, could use EFSI, especially for R&D projects or uh, pilot projects or pilot plans, etc. Because uh, sometimes those new products and, and piloting uh, exercises um, are riskier or the return expectations are uh, very high from the day one, so there is a need for risk bearing capacity. That's why I, I said to you that please convey this message that EFSI is in, in everybody's disposal. It does not solve all the problems in the world, but it's a good machine to cover part of the private investor's risk. And that's why please convey, on, uh, convey this message to, to the forest industry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now we have the opportunity also to put some questions to Mr. Hetemäki after his excellent intervention. Is there anyone who wants to ask him about anything? Please do. There we have it. Yeah, maybe I'll use the microphone. Hi, Laurie, uh, I'm Abius, Wageningen University. Um, what you often see in, in the whole bioeconomy uh, discussion and, and, and uh, the, in, the investments, it's all very much focused on the new technology, the new products, new factories, uh, and thus we expect a very high demand in the future. But what in my mind is very often lacking is also the connection to the forestry part. And if the forest and the forestry does not respond to this, then uh, in my mind the bioeconomy is, is under a, a big risk of, of maybe already collapsing before it has even started. If the forestry and the forest owners do not respond and are not invested in, then this bioeconomy will have a, a, well, a big challenge in the future. How, how do you see this connection, how that connection can be improved in, in the European forests? Okay. Okay. I first have to acknowledge how different the countries are. In some places, I think the markets are taking care of uh, the supply of uh, wood. In some other areas, this is not the case, where you have a large number of very small private forest owners. What we have observed recently in, in Europe also is investment funds that have come to the forest uh, to... to uh, and I, I think what we will see in the future is new players coming in the forest. We are still having the 16 million private forest owners that are essential and there are big challenges uh, uh, with them. They don't even perhaps know that they own forest in some cases. But uh, I, I would expect that if we have the increase of uh, these many new bioeconomy products, we will find the supply. Just to take the example of uh, Finland, in, in my whole life I don't remember a situation where a factory hasn't been able to produce anything because they don't get the tree. So, uh, but it's not the case everywhere. It's a challenge, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. One more question. Down there. Okay. The narrative. Yes, I, 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 I was two months ago giving a lecture in, in Germany for the German forest science community 
uh, about the bioeconomy. And, and a professor uh, posed me a question that in a region where cutting a tree is killing a tree, how can you advance bioeconomy? And my answer was that uh, you need to tell fact-based narrative that is appealing for the urban population in German, where 80% of the population is living. How, when they wake up in the morning and go to sleep in the night, how they have used during their whole day uh, wood fiber-based products in many different things, and how they are able to provide sustainability for the urban life. I think this story has not been told. We are very much focused on rural jobs, rural areas. With the bioeconomy, we have to have a narrative for the urban population, which is fact-based, not uh, nonsense. Okay, thank you, Lauri Hettemäki, and thank you for good questions. Now I think we have um, to go to the next point on the agenda, and that is needs and innovations in monitoring resilient bioeconomy development, a new EFI study. Bernhard Wolfslehner, head of our office in Central, East and South East European Regional. Please take the floor. So that's a very good afternoon. Uh, yeah, forest by economy, a new scope for sustainability indicators. And I've been asked, is this study coming timely, or why is it, why is it coming now? And now I've, I've been following the discussions here. So we've been talking about stretching the production possibility frontiers. Lowry said, how much could be sustainable? We heard about how can we secure that our ecosystem services are properly valued, and it's not only wood. Uh, Mr. Katainen said that we need to secure that we have a common understanding on this on the sustainability <coughs> of bioeconomy. So sitting there in row three confirmed me that the study we did is coming timely right now. I think I would like to stretch two major arguments. On so the one thing, I think we have the big opportunity talking about forest bioeconomy now that we can discuss our monitoring and our instruments like indicators, not in an ex post approach. So we're not just stepping into something and then 20 years afterwards we measure what have been the impact. I think there's a big opportunity here. And, and also one of our jobs was to uh, provide the scientific basis for that. And the second point is that the forest sector as such can bring a lot of assets in the monitoring issues, in sustainability indicator issues. So I think this, there's a lot of opportunities to learn also from these experiences. And I will show some instances uh, on uh, on, on, on this topic of how sustainability indicator can fit into a bioeconomy monitoring. So quickly, we had three major goals for this study. So the first thing is that we evaluate different monitoring instruments and how they could be fit to a sustainable forest bioeconomy. Then the particular issues of indicators. So indicators are not something that just our small group forestry people uses. I think it's a worldwide issue now. Think of the sustainable development goals. Uh, think of, 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 of other global initiatives where indicators are used. So we really want to see how different aspects fit into the broader scope of bioeconomy. And then, of course, explore a bit. I mean, this study is, on the one hand, to prepare the scientific basis, but also do a bit of exploratory study to see where these bioeconomy indicators could go to. And I would give you some insights on that. Uh, what's important from our understanding of a, of a bioeconomy is that we have to, dealing with a value chain approach. I think that's pretty consistent also with what Lowry told us. So we are now leaving the forest, the resource side, and moving towards different stages. We could even easily link this to the concept of circular economy, as we just heard, uh, also to the issues of green economy. But just to have a clear understanding that we are leaving the forest now and really talking about uh, the the first from the first stages to the end of, of a product or a service circle. And this, of course, is related to a demanding policy environment. So, I mean, all of us, we told about the stories about the fragmented policy framework and that we have no forest policy in the EU. And if we expand this concept now towards a value chain approach, it's even getting maybe more, not complicated, but more complex. But on the other hand, as you can see from this graph, is that there's huge opportunities to link to the 
the, the major commission priorities or the, the EU principles. I think there's a, a huge opportunity not only to complain that everything is so fragmented, but also uh, demonstrate significance. But for this, we need tools and instruments. Uh, I think we heard throughout the discussion that in a bioeconomy, sustainable development is a, necess a necessary condition, also particularly linked to a resource-based economy like the forest-based bioeconomy. And the question that we asked ourselves is how to measure, how to monitor, and also how to assess a forest bioeconomy development. So it's not only just enough to produce data, but also how to interpret them, how to assess whether the direction is going in a favorable uh, uh, side or, or an adverse side. Uh, as I said earlier, so the forest sector as such, or the forestry sector, has a rich, rich competence uh, and ex expertise in the development of indicators. So most of us are familiar with the uh, uh, sustainable forest management definitions and the criterion indicators for sustainable forest management that basically have been developed over the past 22 years and now even been refined last year in Madrid. So something that's a, a very strong expertise, but also a very sectoral expertise. And uh, for this bioeconomy discussions now, we tried to maybe look a step further and also see what lies in there. Uh, also, in a study that we did in 2013, we published, we also found that there are five major, major things that really make in indicator framework fly in a way or be successful. Uh, and I think our starting point was that there's a lot to learn from that. Uh, so on the one hand, that's a, a clear instrument to uh, frame dialogue and communication. I mean, in bioeconomy now we are talking about different sectors coming together, different stakeholders coming together to really form a sort of definit definitory power uh, what we are talking about. I think this is a, is, a, is a strong asset in this tool. And then also to see how there is progress towards, is there progress, is there no progress? So I think that's something uh, that's also related to improving the quality of data. I think also an issue we I will come back to later. So do we have comparable data, in particular, if we're leaving a sort of sectoral boundary, a very important aspect in a sort of data-driven society? And then third, of course, something for the national policy development. I think it's important to have a common frame uh, to assess progress. And what's a very important finding from this study is that we need an information tool that sort of allows communication between sectors. So this is something surprisingly that we found out that there's still a lot of barriers when comparing data, when sort of accept, accepting uh, the information that's carried between different sectors. And I think that's something to be, to be overcome in a, in a, in a, in a bioeconomy setup. Uh, as I said, 20 years of expertise, but still, of course, a, a lot of room for improvement. And I think that's just fair, also the opportunity to say where, where we could go. So basically, it's, this, it's a, the, the Scope so far is rather narrow in terms that we're pretty much focusing on the resource side. So pretty much wood in the forest, then a little bit of, of other aspects have been tackled so far. I mean, we just heard about the ecosystem services. That's one of the issues that need to be reflected in a, in a forest bioeconomy as well. Uh, the limited outreach I mentioned already. And then what we found, of course, because we've been screening quite a bit of, of, of data bases, resources, statistics, that there's still a quite quite a divide and that's not only for forest indicators and uh, to make data comparable to make them comparable um, uh, among countries to make them comparable along uh, along the value chain and I think this is really a big issue if we want to reflect the the, the significance uh, of the forest based sector in a bioeconomy that we really have a sort of complete picture here so after all I think the starting point is one of them that creates opportunities. So I think uh, on the one hand, there are a lot of issues that can directly relate to, to, to the forest-based sector that are addressed in the, in the bioeconomy strategy. Uh, on the other hand, we were looking into defining intersectional tools that uh, seek the compliance with other sectors and initiatives. And then also to, I mean, one of the issues that we really want to know, I mean, also learning from experiences when we've been rushing into the first bioenergy boom or so, is that we want to have tools that are ready for impact assessment or something like this. So not just producing data, but also telling us whether this has a positive or negative impact in the end. So coming to the new UFI study, I think all of you have got them. It's pretty fresh out of the print. And what we did there is on the one hand that we screened a broad 
array of, of indicators that could fit or could be linked to a bioeconomy. So I think it was over 200 uh, potential candidates. And then, of course, we also had to see whether they are useful or not, and whether there are data gaps. So in the end, it was like um, less than 50% that we could really have sort of reliant data in the end. And then we also wanted to conceptualize a bit how these indicators could be fit to the five major challenges uh, of the bioeconomy strategy. And after all, then we explored three pathways, which I will briefly explain right now, where these uh, bioeconomy indicators could go towards. Nothing to learn by heart now, so you don't have to read, just feel. Uh, it's basically, this first picture shows us where the current indicators for the sustainable forest management, where they could be located along the forest value chain. So if you see pretty much on the, on the, on the early parts of the value chains, very much in the forest, and uh, uh, I think this, if we expand this concept then towards a, 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 a broader concept, then uh, we see that maybe this is not enough. And there the first part was our screening how a bioeconomy indicator sets could look like. So additions in blue. Just have a look again. So this is where we're currently. And this is something where we developed some proposals how the, f the full value chain could be complemented. So where we have something like green jobs, where we have sort of carbon balances, uh, where we have uh, ecosystem services along the chain. So a, a lot of issues, you will find the details in the study, just to get an impression. So this would be the option, building on our existing forest indicators, but try to complement them uh, and, and broaden the concept. So I think the common notion is also that we can really build on something. You don't have to start from scratch. Second thing, also not to read now, uh, is the issue, and what I'm talking here is not our invention, but is sort of also the summary of what's currently going on in indicator development around the globe. So one of the issues is the, the idea of developing subsets of indicators. So this means not always having this huge long list and they're getting huger and huger and you cannot communicate them, but either have thematic subsets or even sectoral subsets that somehow come together in a common framework and also see how to make them comparable and also how to make them transient towards the borders, yeah, to find common linking points between those indicators. So this would be one issue where we could say we could already think of a sort of cross-sectional indicator set where we bring in together what we have and try to develop or mold something out new out of that. And ideally, if there is a sort of common denominator across these this subsets, this could lead to something like option three where we're talking about bioeconomy key indicators. Because what we learned from the past is that we constantly tend to deal with 70, 80, 40, sometimes different indicators. And apart from the experts, nobody is able to understand what we're talking about. Yeah? And one of the issues that basically as a preparation for this event, I asked some people back home, are you familiar with the bioeconomy? Nobody said yes. Yeah? And this is also one of the issues where we need some, something like key information. Yeah? And it's not only PR, but it's also like the key data or something like that and with a, with a common frame of interpretation. So the concept of key indicators is also something that's discussed globally, uh, how to really reach the public with what we're doing here. And with these three options, I have to say on the one hand, they're explot exploratory. So we don't anticipate the process where these indicators are developed because one of the most important thing, developing indicators is not a technical exercise. It's in particular in this frame a political exercise. And I think this is very important also to uh, recognize the, the, the proper procedures, how to reach them and to reach the consensus. And as you might have learned also from my telling is that they are not mutually exclusive. So it's not either or. It could also mean a sort of development over time. And I think since there's no time to lose, it's also something where we could stepwise go uh, into the future uh, with the learning experience and also this uh, discourse on how this should look like in the end. So coming to an end, uh, on the one hand, the synthesis, how a roadmap towards a European bioeconomy monitoring could look like. So the main issues that we identified in this study is on the one hand that clearly this has to reach beyond the forest sector boundaries to really have a sort of accepted approach. And we think that the forest based sector has a huge opportunity to, to uh, provide substantial input to such a, a, a bioeconomy mo monitoring based on its experiences and the significance of the sector. I think one of the issues was clear is to harmonize the data acquisition and assessment. So what we currently see, just an example, the diversification of the sector. Also, Laurie told us about that. So that there is a traditional forest-based sector and then there are new forms like the services, like new products and materials. 
And the information on this is very fragmented. We don't really have a complete overview about what is the true dimension of, of, of the modern based sector in a bioeconomy. So I think there's a lot to be done. And an indicator approach could work on that or could support that. Also, what we think is, I mean, we're coming together in, in, for Think Forest now for a couple of years, and we think everything is changing so rapidly. So what we should strive for is, is developing a flexible tool that could easily be complemented towards new trends and not something that is very rigid. And then in 10 years, we say everything is outdated and we have to start again. I think this is a very important issue to create some flexibility in, 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 in our monitoring tools. And of course, one thing is linking to the political arena. So this means to the global issues, we have to connect to the sustainable development goals, to the national issues. We just heard from Mr. Katainen. So there's no one, one size fits all solution also with the indicators. I think a very important issue to also tackle the political spices in this discussion. And then something we need sort of something where a platform is created where these this, this forces can be joined in developing these indicators. The policy implications out of that, and this is the real end now, is on the one hand, I think we heard about it, we need to cap better capture the synergies and trade-offs of what's going on in a bioeconomy. I think Bo said, it's like, how can we prevent that if we replace oil by, by timber, how can we prevent that this is, is, has an, an adverse effect? But also how to, how to demonstrate the synergies in a, in a bioeconomy development. I think the harmonized use of monitoring and statistics will help to really reflect the diversification or the diversified forest-based sector. Uh, on the other hand, I, I just said, I mean, there's a lot of experience. So I think it would be a mistake just to start again from scratch. Let's use this experience. Let's, let's use the instruments that are out there. Let's complement them. Let's explore where we can really improve uh, and where we can capitalize on what we did since Rio 1992. So I think the sustainability science is there. The development is there. So let's do that. Uh, and uh, also, I mean, I, I say it again, a cross-sectional forum should really could really support it, that it's not a sort of, 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 of dead solution, but there's something that's very vivid uh, when we find broad consensus on how, sh how this should be used. Uh, an issue that we discussed quite thoroughly then in the end is, is how to deal with, you know, we, we don't want to come up with a sort of top-down EU solution body, but also how to reflect this, this national specifics and how this can be connected. Uh, how, how this can, a, a new framework on bioeconomy can be connected to national strategies, but also to tools and also the forest sector with the national forest programs, for example, has learned quite a bit on how top-down and bottom-up uh, initiatives and participation also could, could look like. I said, how many people do you know who are familiar with the bioeconomy? So in my view, indicators have a huge potential to communicate the bioeconomy better. And I think we should utilize it on top of what we're doing uh, on different levels. Uh, I think this is a, a, a great potential here that we can really significantly process. And finally, I think this, this common platform, be it the, we have some like the Bioeconomy Observatory about the Future Bioeconomy Knowledge Center. So there are a lot of instruments also on stakeholder and political level. So there is something that really could also bring this together and push this further to improve the efficiency and also the consensus on bioeconomy monitoring. I think something that's badly needed also when are listening to the discussions on the sustainable development of bioeconomy. And with this, I'm coming to an end. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Wolfs-Lehner. There is room for at least one question. Anyone? Okay, down there. Someone.
Okay, how much time do we have? Does it work? Yeah. <laughs> A pretty complex question. Yeah, first, I mean, the linearity of the value chain, of course, it's to make things easier. So I agree that it's not that linear, but it's a sort of visual thing that we try to grasp, at least the most important elements. I think the partic participatory elements uh, are of, of, of major importance in terms that the, we, on the one hand, create a balanced picture. So I think lessons from the, from the past always showed that if, a, if an indicator set is sort of developed in a way where a few strong players shape it, in a direction we would never come up with a, with, a, with a balanced approach. And then the credibility of an instrument is exactly at stake when we see, okay, then we, we keep to ourselves if this happens. Yeah? So here we have the opportunity to get a bit broader. Also, I think the public plays a, a, a key role. Uh, and there I think that this balance is, is, is important. What I said, how participation could look like is on the one hand, I think on national level there it's important. I think there's a, a broader podium also to involve stakeholders and uh, how to implement that in a, on a national level. And I think that I think the, the bioeconomy strategy is yet to be developed in many countries. Uh, there's a big opportunity also to, to add in with the indicator framework. And on the other end, as I said, on larger level, like on EU level, the indicator development is not a technical process. So I think one should avoid to think of it as a technical uh, exercise where, where two handfuls of, of, of experts are sort of get it together somewhere in the back room and they come up with the perfect solution. So I think this is also something that, that's also what we learned from Forest Europe, that on the one hand, there is broad debate possible. On the other hand, also self-critically, it's so one, once an indicator set is fixed, it's very difficult to change it again. That's also, I think, one of the lessons that we learned from Forest Europe, uh, although we're still working on that. But it's, so this needs a, a, good, a good first shot. That would be my advice. Okay, thank you. If it's short, because we are running out of time. Yes, okay. Yeah, many thanks. Uh, Ingvald Schwantl from Austria, from the Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, Environment and Water Management. Uh, excellent piece of work. Um, congratulations. My question is, is there any idea uh, or um, plan on how to operationalize, operationalize such a broad concept as a, for, for the sustainable forest management in the case that okay, we have at least a ministerial conference, yeah, the uh, ministers representing their governments and the signatory states to adopt them. Uh, is there any plan on how this could be carried further into operation? Into operation? Thank you. I mean, it's, it's, it's not up to me to, to communicate a plan on that. What I know and I, I've been, uh, my group is also involved that in, in the context of Forest Europe, we're also developing towards green economy, how it is defined there. Uh, I think there are discussions in the, in, with the SDGs, so I think there is a lot of synergies also to harvest how, how to connect that in, in other levels of the European Union, for example. So I think this is not a, would not be a standalone activity. So for, with Forest Europe, we, we proceed, and I think it's also here something. We had these discussions also in the, in, in, in with the uh, ad hoc group on, on indicators in the last years, I think it's not done yet. Okay, uh, it's an excellent question because it um, bridges us to the panel. And we can start with that discussion in the panel, how to do it. And uh, first, before the panel, thank you once more, Dr. Wolf Lerner. <laughs> and now I invite the panel to take their seats. It is Mr. John Bell, Frederick Federley, it is uh, Madam Elizabeth Kostinger and Professor Bart Moyes. Please. Jeans. Yeah. Yeah. 
Just a short introduction from left side, from up here, right from your. John Bell is director for the bioeconomy in DG Research and Innovation. Then we have uh, the member of parliament, Elizabeth Köstinger. She is a full member of the Committee on Agriculture and Rural Development, among many other things. Mm -hmm. And a firm supporter for the forest issues is inside the parliament with a very successful seminar this morning also. Congratulations. <laughs> and uh, Frederick Federley, also not a full member, but a, an um, Substitute. Substitute, that is the name, in the same committee. Full coming working. Full working, as always. <laughs> a true Swede. Full working. Coming from Sweden and the Centre Party. And then Professor Bert Moes, a full professor of forest ecology and management at the University of Leuven in Belgium. Welcome. Thank you. We start with the question, the broad question how to make this happen. And we start with John Bell, I think, who is the one who is responsible to see to that things happen. We trust you, John. Tell us now. Well, that's the first nice thing I've heard about the top-down approach in the Commission all day. <laughs> um, I think, to actually, to begin with, uh, a lot of us are kind of a little bit uh, uh, downhearted after the last couple of weeks, but I think uh, what most people have to realise is that 2016 would be a footnote to 2015 in history. 2015 is when everything changed. Our sustainable development goals set out where we're definitely going, regardless of who's in the driving seat or where we're sitting or which organisations we're sitting in. Uh, and uh, Paris is setting out uh, what the boundary conditions are going to be to get there sustainably. So the political will, which is the most important thing first, uh, at the political level that we are going to do this, I think is the most important thing for us. And that means bringing people on board. Now, uh, part of my job, I sit in the research and innovation part of the Commission where we've led this bioeconomy strategy, which will be reviewed as Vice President Katainen said next year. And it is a great privilege to be out there and seeing the bioeconomies of Europe developing in different ways. And so to make it happen, what has to happen is on the one hand you need a political recognition that this is where we're going to and it's happening and it's a thing and it's, it's, it's out there. And whether we're talking about very mature bioeconomies in places like the, the forest bioeconomies which are ahead or the new bioeconomies that are emerging in 10 of the 15 member states who've drafted uh, national bioeconomy strategies, Italy's one being the most recent, uh, there's a number of things that people need. They need political clarity in terms of what are the terms of, of the debate? And I think we've heard uh, Mia Petria this morning, or earlier on was talking about, and, and the Vice President, about some of the issues that are there. What's the balance between the different bioeconomies' needs, their biomass resources, what they need in terms of what we've just been talking about, indicators? How can we monitor where we are in terms of supply and demand, in terms of skills, in terms of investment, in terms of logistics? There's a whole series of very practical things that we need to put in place. And I think uh, certainly here in the European institutions, across a whole range of policies at the moment, what we're trying to do is to make sure that we're framing the, re the questions in the right way. It's, it's not about we just reach for one or other instrument or the big discussions going on at the moment uh, uh, about you know how do you look at the needs of biomass, for example, in, in terms of certain different policy areas. Well, we need to ask the right questions. So how do we get there? We need, first of all, political will. Second of all, we need to have uh, a knowledge and an ability to measure the resources and the issues that we're talking about. And that means asking the right questions, maybe not the questions that our political leaders want to know within a political cycle. That's one of the unfortunate duties of the Commission, is to ask the questions that need to be asked over time so that we can have political certainty, business certainty, biodiversity certainty, a kind of sustainability across the three areas of sustainability, economic, social and environmental, that's rooted in a kind of investment and a kind of policy uh, that is both bottom up from the regions uh, and that can be top down in terms of legislation that enables uh, uh, intelligent uh, growth to take place. Um, I think we also need to have uh, the kind of research and innovation investment 
across the different aspects of the bioeconomy and from uh, you know ideas right the way through to the marketplace. And there, I think, we now have a complete array of instruments in place. We have in Horizon 2020, whether we're talking about the forest-based bioeconomy or different parts of the bioeconomy, we have a whole array of research and innovation projects uh, rolling out. We have the bio-based industries, 3.7 billion euro uh, public-private investment, where I think it's looking very promising in terms of the amount of public sec uh, private sector investment that's coming. I would read that there's at least 4 billion euros of investment in the bioeconomy in the pipeline, and for the first time, investment coming from, and this predates last week, the United States to Europe uh, in, in some areas. Um, and then with FC, as uh, Vice President Katayan was saying, we have the high-risk uh, area of investment. So we have a whole suite of tools, and Commissioner Wedesh will be bringing on stream uh, the European Innovation Council, which is really to look into the value of death kind of risk. So we have, you need the political will, you need the ability to know and to measure what's going on, you need the instruments, and probably first but not last, is you need, uh, a number of people have said this, um, the bioeconomy really is about growth where people live which is basically what is this whole political debate at the moment is all about. Economics and growth is talked about in the macro sense up there in terms of GDP figures and traded services. And what is going on there is to find a new model of growth and the development that takes root in real communities, whether in rural or coastal or city areas. And I think this is where the bioeconomy can mobilize the public to define what the bioeconomy is and should be for them. So, I'm an Irish person, and even though they got rid of most, I won't say who they are, they got rid of most of our forestry to flush us out a few hundred years ago. Um, I'm a very passionate uh, 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 proponent of the importance of not just supporting the forest based bioeconomy, but learning from what has happened there first and seeing what else we can learn. And a footnote to that I remember when you came to see Commissioner Mwedesh, uh, Mr. Person, your comments about the role, if we think about things in a different way, if the decarbonisation and the re reduction in greenhouse gases and growth are two of our major issues, we need to look at how we, we build a new bio-based construction industry, for example, which could do both. Uh, so we need to be creative also at the end of the day. I'll stop there. Thank you. And uh, Madam Kostinger, what do you think is the most important thing to do? Um, yeah, as uh, we are to get a policy makers, I think uh, for us it's the most important thing to provide a, a, a framework, a political framework, a legal framework, who gives really incentives for, uh, first of all, the ones who are working in the forest and uh, who are mobilizing uh, the wood for all uh, the, the afterwards uh, uh, stages, more or less. Um, I think this is the, the, the most important thing. We are talking so much about uh, criteria in any possible thinking ways, and sometimes I think we are uh, forgetting about the ones uh, who have to live with this. <laughs> and uh, I, I know that it's very important uh, to meet all the challenges and to look into the future. Uh, but uh, I think also from a political point of view, we shouldn't forget the people who have to deal and have to work with all this. Uh, on, on some stage, very theoretical level, we are talking about. And um, what, what I, for example, get from, from at home and from all the people I'm, I'm talking to, uh, they don't trust us uh, sometimes anymore that we uh -huh. really uh, provide <laughs> a good uh, framework for them. And they always hear what they have to do and what they have to deliver. And um, especially in, in also some campaigns and newspapers, it's um, uh, we, we, we had uh, such uh, campaigns in, in Austria some, some years ago that it's uh, more or less a bad thing to cut trees uh, and green politicians uh, tend to uh, hug the trees uh, and uh, more or less um, uh, keep them alive. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's sometimes really hard for the people to understand uh, what's, what's going on because they do their business for, for ages, for generations. And I think this is the most important thing for us uh, in, in politics to, uh, on the one side, create a vision, on the other side, uh, take the hand of the people and, and, and bring all these different aspects together um, and, and explain w what we want actually from them. I think this is one of the most important things. Okay, thank you. And Frederick Federley, if you had 
the chance to decide on your own fully about this sector, what would you do then? <coughs> The narrative, for instance. I, I would say I would uh, try to open it uh, because we are we're seeing a massive change now, and I do think that we've only been grasping on the sur hi there. We had dinner last week. Uh, <coughs> we had uh, we've only been grasping on the surface uh, of what we actually can get from uh, from the forestry sector and the bio sector in Europe, uh, and I think that it's a big problem when we in politics uh, only talk about forests and we never talk about fibers. It gives a perception that every tree is used in just one way. That, that also uh, paves the way for uh, uh, putting in policy the cascading principle, uh, cascading principle, because the concept is that you have one forest, you cut uh, all the trees down and you sell them for one product. Uh, what we're coming to now, especially in Sweden and in Finland, is the understanding of the different qualities of the fibers of one tree can be used for many different uh, things. Some for paper and pulp, some for actually fabrics. That also gives us a discussion on what substitution means uh, in this uh, context. So what are we uh, using uh, the fibers to uh, get rid of other things. It might be uh, to create biofuels, getting away with uh, fossil fuels. It might be for district heating, which is very common in Sweden and in Finland. Uh, but that, that you don't use the finest fibers for. Uh, and if you come down also to something that is quite recently and uh, being exploited and which will grow and which will have a major global environmental impact is when we start producing on a, a much bigger scale fabrics uh, from, from uh, cellulosa. Uh, wearing cotton today, be aware that you are supporting a massively bad environmental impact industry. With poor working conditions, massive use of pesticides, massive use of water in poor conditions and labor conditions we would never accept in Europe. Cellulosa can provide one of the pieces to actually make sure that we have the clothes in our body that we want. We're producing a new industry and new innovation in other parts. So I think that coming down to talking more of fiber and the content of the forest and not just about forest. We have a huge <coughs> uh, uh, task, uh, uh, me and Elisabeth as uh, being policymakers in the European Parliament, to get our colleagues to understand the variety of forests and that a forest is not, is not a constant. Just about a hundred years ago, we almost had no forest in Sweden. The oldest parts of forest we have are the ones that the kings planted in the 15 1600s, the oaks, that were supposed to be warships uh, a few hundred years later. Uh, the rest of it we took down about a hundred years ago uh, to uh, create the heating we needed for the winter and also to, uh, to go into a really productive industry. Today we have massive forests in Sweden and the biomass is year by year growing. We are not taking out uh, the annual growth uh, out, out of the biomass in Sweden. And if we create a legislation which is based on fixed numbers, not understanding that with the sun, with water, we actually get more of the biomass, then we are creating a problem. And the last point, if we try to solve uh, problems in parts of the union where we have de deforestation, uh, where we haven't been having replanting uh, um, ideas in, in the forest management. We're trying to fix that by hampering the uh, bioeconomy which is growing and functioning in other parts. Then we're creating more problem and absolutely not solving the problems that we want to do. So we have to make sure that we take, as you said, Mr. Mr. Passion, uh, into account the different regional aspects of both the biomass, climate and also national uh, policies on how we actually have the forest management done. Thank you, Frederick. <coughs> Professor Morris, what do you think about this question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We heard already that 2015 was a, a turning point in our views on, on our future, saying that we want to get rid of the fossil fuel economy. Um, but we have it less clear uh, what the bioeconomy and sustainable bioeconomy uh, could mean in, in a long future. And, uh, I would say, as a statement, the future is more. And um, I would say um, the future is more, not referring to more biomass or more forest, but uh, uh, referring to Thomas More, uh, the English philosopher 500 years ago, who wrote 500, exactly 500 years ago this uh, book, Utopia. And we are looking too much into the near future, looking at uh, recent trends, 
but the recent trends, they show uh, maybe the result of outdated uh, policies of the past. So we should more dream about uh, where what do we want to land with the uh, bioeconomy in 30, 50 years from here and have a more strategic vision on, on that. And uh, if I dream about uh, the sustainable uh, future, and I was invited by my university to think uh, 500 years later of what the relationship between humans and forests could be 500 years after Thomas More, I come to the conclusion that we had already a bioeconomy in the past. There was already some reference to the Irish landscape in the 19th century, and that's probably not the type of bioeconomy we want to go back to. Uh, uh, a landscape void of trees and forests and uh, deep rural poverty. I think uh, our bioeconomy should be something else. And if we say now that we should uh, uh, replace the, the fossil uh, energy by uh, the bioenergy, we won't uh, get there. You can calculate for yourself that uh, if we uh, take uh, the National Renewable Energy Action Plans and uh, take more than 50% of uh, that uh, targets from the forest, that uh, there's two options. Uh, uh, the trees will disappear from the Euro European forest, or uh, we will create a, a tremendous um, uh, land uh, uh, pressure somewhere else. So uh, importing from the United States or, or anywhere else. So I think that the bioeconomy of the future is something uh, fundamentally different. Um, and let's see here uh, the, the forest landscape as I would see it in 50 years. One third of that forest landscape goes, uh, yeah, and we take, not, of course, not more uh, than the increments. Because uh, now people see all this uh, biomass stocks, but stock is a very bad indicator of what the forest can deliver. We should look at the increments as uh, the potential that the forest has. And of those increments, uh, I think we could take one third for uh, consumables. That means uh, fuel or uh, refineries, but much better refineries. And fuels, they can still play a role, but uh, uh, there's reasons to believe that this is a minor. We should go to solar and wind. There are the real solutions. Bioenergy can do something uh, to, uh, if there's no wind or no, no solar, to speed up uh, some, some power plants. Uh, to uh, produce uh, local energy in mountainous area with lots of uh, biomass, we don't know what to do with it. Um, but th this is something minor. And the reason is that uh, we could run out of uh, energy. Uh, it's also a very low efficient uh, way of producing energy. Our uh, wind and uh, solar technology are much more efficient than what photosynthesis can ever do. And uh, there's also a new item and, for example, uh, here in Belgium, uh, local governments are now already uh, uh, trying to convince people of not using open hearts and uh, uh, wood stoves anymore because uh, they produce so much uh, small particles. And uh, the, new, uh, uh, the, the new reasoning is that uh, one evening with your uh, open heart, it's nice to do, but it's like 300 kilometers uh, driving with a lorry. It's the same amount of small particles produced. So no way to go. Uh, so one third of our landscape uh, production goes into biorefineries, a bit of biofuels, uh, for example, for, for, for airplanes, because there we can't use electricity. For cars, we can use electricity in the future. But for airplanes, it's difficult. So we can take it from the biomass. Then one third for... Um, uh, for uh, construction, uh, for solid materials that uh, have a long, uh, long term, like uh, think about uh, the, the new uh, engineered timber, and then one third, and that's also often forgotten, uh, letting for nature. And you know, there's a strong tendency in Natura 2000 to uh, rewild the uh, uh, European nature. There's reasons for that. Uh, uh, there's uh, issues of biodiversity, but there's also issues of global planetary uh, ecosystem uh, services that we really need. So we will have to give back some of our forests to nature. And I think this one third, one third, one third is the utopian dream I have and uh, where there's still lots of opportunities for uh, a sustainable uh, uh, bioeconomy. Thank you.
Thank you. And if that's a dream, how to make it happen? Have you any ideas about that? Uh, I think uh, this is happening already. Um, the, uh, in the bioenergy, uh, we see already that uh, sustainability uh, criteria uh, are, uh, are indicating where we go. Uh, there's uh, already countries that have uh, sus uh, sustainability uh, indicators uh, for solid biomass. Uh, there's already uh, decisions to not build uh, new uh, power plants uh, on, bio, uh, on biomass imported from, from the United States because it's just not sustainable and it's a, a waste of, uh, uh, of subsidies that uh, can be much better spent in the real uh, alternatives. And uh, yeah, also uh, giving back uh, land to nature. Uh, this is an ongoing uh, process. And uh, there will be an increase in, uh, in, uh, in science evidence that uh, the planet needs this uh, space for uh, natural processes, or more like, uh, like uh, one third uh, of the terrestrial surface uh, set aside for, uh, uh, well, uh, for natural processes. Okay. Um, it is also now a possibility for, for you to intervene. Uh, now it's not just questions, you can have opinions about everything. Uh, what they say, so we have a living discussion. And I start to giving the floor to Mr. Harmele, who already have intervened, and then it's Fedele. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So just one question to Professor Muis. You spoke about rewilding the nature. Is it possible to rewild it really without massive forest fires? Because traditionally, so it was forest fires which took care of the, which gave a major contribution to rewilding and uh, regeneration in nature. And also the other thing, or connected with this, is that what Mr. Federle said about the Swedish forest 200 years ago, when there were very little trees after burn and slash cultivation, swift cultivation, tar burning, whatsoever, mines, and, 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 and forest grazing, grazing cattle in forest. I have read so that biodiversity at that time was higher in Swedish forests than ever after, ever since. Oh. So now what is the real connection between removing trees, of course, to a fair extent, not, not all of them. Rewilding the nature, regeneration of nature, management of nature. Nowadays, it's very often thought that biodiversity lives in old growth only. That's not true. Removals take part of creating bio diversity, which traditionally was done by forest fires. Thank you. Okay. Uh, reactions on that, Professor? Yes, this is a very interesting and a very uh, relevant uh, question, uh, where we have thought a, a lot about. And indeed, uh, in some circumstances, biodiversity needs uh, rewilding, and in other circumstances, biodiversity has a benefit with uh, management and quite intensive management. And we just uh, published a, a paper in uh, Frontiers in Ecology and Environment uh, two weeks ago where we uh, calculated the uh, bioenergy or bio, uh, uh, bio refinery uh, potential of the Natura 2000 uh, if it's about grasslands. And there is the same. There's uh, a tremendous amount of grasslands that need management to be kept. So it's, it's, it's double. In some areas, you can choose for rewilding. Uh, it, it, it are mainly areas where uh, uh, forest management is of rather uh, recent uh, uh, times. And their rewilding can, uh, uh, can have a benefit for, for biodiversity because you can turn quite easily back 
to the values that you still have there. But in many other circumstances where the management uh, history is much longer, and I think, uh, for example, about uh, Central and also uh, Southern European forests, uh, there there's a lot of biodiversity in the, in the forest fringe or even in, in grasslands or agriculture lands uh, that had a, a marginal uh, use. And so there we can create uh, mixed mosaic landscapes where some, bi uh, some biomass is coming out, uh, regulating fires and protecting biodiversity altogether with uh, producing some, some biomass. So yes, it's, it's double. When I said we have to give back one third of the land to nature, that does not mean that in all of those cases there, w there would be no biomass uh, removal at all. It depends, uh, and in some areas there's more potential for doing nothing, and in other areas there's more potential for having a certain uh, biomass extraction. Thank you. Uh, yes, you yeah. may ask a question before I give. And who, who should decide <laughs> on this? Who, who, who well, makes the uh, a criteria uh, on, on which uh, base? <laughs> it, it's a it, it's a multi uh, ecosystem service uh, question. Oh, uh, yeah. So you have to optimize, and uh, there are people uh, from from the biodiversity point of view that will give uh, their opinion on uh, where you should. Uh, uh, rewild and where you should have a, a, a management, but of course this has to be uh, brought together with, 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 with other ecosystem services and we should optimize our landscapes uh, the best we can. Okay. <coughs> well, it, well, to me that, that uh, the idea of having one third, one third, one third, it, it could be an interesting theoretical discussion, <coughs> but to me it's a quite frightening picture of how we try to regulate the market and private ownership. And also not taking into account that uh, using uh, biofuels in Sweden, Finland, uh, parts of Austria, Germany and a few other places where we have <coughs> a productive, uh, uh, responsible use of, of the, the, the biomass uh, could be really sustainable. But of course, talking about replacing... <laughs> Uh, petrol and diesel in Greece with, with uh, locally produced biofuels, that will not happen. And th that's where I wanted to make the remark. We have to have uh, understanding of the different contexts that we're actually in. Uh, uh, it can't be so that parts of the European Union where they cut down the trees a few thousand years ago and still haven't replanted them should set the model for the rest of the Union. Uh, we were not the best in the class in Sweden, as I said in my first uh, initial statement, but we are getting at least to the top front runners uh, on the globe, and that is due to responsible private ownership by people, and I, I will say that we have a few, and you know this, uh, a few really large companies owning a lot of uh, forest uh, in Sweden, but I think that the driving force has also been the small-scale owners because they don't think about a profit for tomorrow. It's investment for future generations, pensions, responsible use of something that also might be a heritage of, of several generations. And also looking into what the chemical industry can do. And this is once again on the substitution. Uh, uh, the chemical industry has their uh, core center in Sweden on the west coast. They said... From 2030, we want to be fossil free in our production of plastics and so on and so forth. So where do we find the substitute? Because we will always need plastic for different reasons, but better plastics. The answer comes from the biomass, and we can do this sustainably. <clears throat> and also talking about the, the harvesting that's going on today. I was, last time I was in this room, it was with, with the European forest owners. Probably some of you attended that debate. Uh, and there was a representative of the forest owners in, in uh, southern France that was saying, we are now losing out of potential output from our forest because we are mismanaging them, because we are not taking care of them good enough, so the production actually decreases. And that is what also happens with a forest which is not managed. You don't have the high level of output. Uh, and the last point, I have a farm in the west of Sweden and my husband is Portuguese. Uh, they're not really used to forest. So, uh, once we were going up there uh, last summer, th there was a place where they had been harvesting the forest. And he said, this is, it looks so horrible. It's like an open wound on the earth. And I said, let's go back here next summer and see what actually happens. And the field where there used to be ten densely, uh, uh, really tight forest, and there were mainly just forests there. The berries had gone because the forest was fully grown. 
there now were plenty of different kinds of flowers. There were bees, there were butterflies. And this is the natural process which you were uh, referring to, which used to happen with fires, which we now are using instead of uh, having uh, the trees dying by themselves, producing a really potent climate gas, methane. We are actually managing uh, the same procedure. We're just speeding it up a bit and we're making sure that it is sustainable. And that also gives us that what is 100% today might just be 70% in 20 years' time if we have a responsible use of the biomass and also make sure that the biomass is growing, which is totally possible to do. Yes, and yes, to fulfill the description of the Swedish success, it was not only about private ownership. No, it, was, uh, it was very much about education and very much about educating ordinary forest owners. Yeah. It was a popular movement. And everything we taught others, we had learned in Germany. And that is also necessary to say. And um, that, is, uh, that is a background. So when we now are taking the next leap in this uh, development, I think education is extremely important because without education, you will never be able to produce or present a narrative that is solid and that will remain as something that people will listen to. You need to be educated. It's not easy, it's not a quick fix, but we can't hesitate to do it, I think. Um, John. You haven't said so much yet. Yes, I'm. I'm. I'm you are, uh, after all, the one who should do. The, un, the uncharacteristic commission voice pleading for humility in what we know and what we can actually uh, assert with certainty. I think what everybody agrees with is that we're at a critical point in the development of. Uh, we talk about the bioeconomy. I'm always a bit nervous about utopias. We've been on the receiving end of a few of them in Europe, and they they turn dystopian uh, quite quickly. I think the the, the Thomas More uh, bit that I would certainly uh, uh, uphold as his openness to reason and to uh, what the evidence is um, that is out there. And I think what we're seeing is in the forest area in particular, you have a particular culture of management in certain types of Europe where a lot can be learned and a lot can be done uh, if it's brought together with basic knowledge and a deeper knowledge as to what it is the potential uh, can bring under the right circumstances. And so uh, I said at the beginning about the importance, the second priority of, of knowing what we know and developing what we don't know as a means of actually being able to manage and to understand, for example, the ecosystems themselves, uh, the potential, for example, the importance of, uh, let's just talk about the forestry potential for a, a bio-based construction industry would have been a, a fantasy 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, now, there's a, because we need to do something about decarbonisation, and we now have the technology uh, maybe to replace a large amount of construction materials with wood-based uh, bio biomaterials, uh, suddenly you, you can talk to your forest owners or your different regions and say, well, um, how could the way in which we use, maintain uh, and, and, and develop uh, the forest bioeconomy in its biodiversity uh, make the best possible contribution locally and to the economy and to the environment in that way. So I, I think we're moving into an area where we need to bring all the different questions together and frame them properly. And that the role of public authorities in research innovation is to make the information and the knowledge uh, available. What I worry about when I listen to some of the debates is everybody is framing the question they know the answer to already. And uh, that's, it's, that's essential in public policy, but it's when we're talking about the longer term, um, th there's a lot of the unintended consequences that can very often come up and bite us very quickly. So um, when we talk about, okay, sustainability and biodiversity, this is a clear concern, but we don't want to have stranded assets. We don't want to have, somebody mentioned earlier on, there are very big investments which have been made. There needs to be pred predictability. We don't want to find that sustainability criteria that were known now about certain forms of bioenergy in five or seven years' time turn around and bite us. So we need to have a way of having, a, I think, a comprehensive understanding of what the options are. And I think we need to see, depending on the different regions, acting according to the right kind of principles and building all the time much more comprehensive understanding of what our options are to take it forward in that way. And, and as I said, like there's no bioeconomy without a biopolity or a biosociety. And that, I think, is an even more difficult challenge, is how to bring people from where they are, where they're basically concerned with their day-to-day -day lives, and see, look, the world that we're going to be moving into uh, will be different and it will require a societal agreement 
Uh, there's a manifesto actually being developed by citizens across Europe about the bioeconomy, which can then maybe influence the kind of policies that can be taken forward together. But uh, yeah, there's no, there's no certainty in the European Commission you'd be glad to hear. There's just a very clear gathering of evidence and knowledge and a, a listening mood on, on this particular one. We're writing our review for next year, so we'll have a lot of questions uh, and data to bring out to our public uh, representatives to see what their views are on all of this and where we take it forward. Do you have many friends inside the Commission regarding this? <laughs> or are there those who are opposing the idea of bioeconomy? No, I think the, the question of the bioeconomy uh, is twofold. Uh, one is you have those who think that the bioeconomy is a word. Um, you know, it's some kind of a word that you use in place of the circular economy without realizing this fundamental shift, this Weltanschauung shift last year. We are moving to a world, one way or the other, in which how, how uh, humankind interacts with the resources on the planet will be defined in a completely different way and we will mobilize our resources and our policies and our science and everything else to make that happen one way or the other over time. Um, and so the bioeconomy is, uh, if you look at all of our biological resources, it's kind of an invisible majority in the way in which we live and we've become detached from it, many of us, not the forest owners or people living in rural communities, as part of urbanization, as part of the way we build our society. So there's also, a, there's also a cultural revolution, that's a horrible phrase to use, but there's, there's, a, there's a cultural uh, reawakening that needs to take place in terms of understanding what does that mean in terms of how we position ourselves on, on, on all kinds of levels. So in the Commission you have those who are, I think, very seriously trying to respond to the most important issue of the time, which is to get the economy back on track and get people back to work, and also to get out of the way of people who are losing trust and faith in, in the political system whilst at the same time making sure that the policy neither prevents the good things that need to happen or creates the kind of damages that can't be repaired in the longer term. So where your friends and enemies come in on that, uh, we're in a kind of collegiate process like the European Parliament. Uh, we're kind of all sitting in a circle uh, and, and we're all accountable to one another, but some decisions will have to be taken over the next year and we have very important policies going through the pipelines at the moment. So your elected representatives will make a decision in the end on what has to be done at a European level, which is the important question you posed at the beginning, what has to be done at a, a local or regional level, what should be enshrined in terms of principles, and what can be done in terms of the monitoring of those principles that will allow us to develop things over time on renewable energy, biomass sustainability, bioenergy, and all of these very exciting subjects where I suspect there will be more people on different sides of the fence by, say, a year's time. Larson. Um, yes, as a, as a former chair of the board of EFI, I'm extremely proud of what's happening here. I think it's really fantastic these kind of discussions are, are taking place on this level here. But also in order to uh, address what you said before, Jeroen Pearson, I, as, a, as a teacher, as a, as a professor, as a teacher of young students, uh, I try to learn them something about that the future must be based upon uncertainty. And uh, I think we have to realize that uh, 30 or 40 years ago, when we asked a forester in Europe, what are you doing with your biodiversity? He would not know what to say. That was a new issue. And therefore, to try to, to uh, postpone some ideas 500 years into the past, it is obsolete. And uh, I look at this uh, uh, sentence here, building an innovative and resilient forest bioeconomy, bio resilience, that means the ability to move away, to bounce back, mm -hmm. and to react upon future challenges and future changes. And I think that is what we are going to base all our policies and all our development upon, and then also upon really sound science. Thank you. Okay, more. Uh, you have asked before the man in the tie, yes. The beautiful tie. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, ne my name is James Hewitt. I work independently. Um, I'm particularly interested in trying to accelerate the bioeconomy and wonder whether scrapping subsidies for fossil fuel would accelerate things effectively. I know they would reduce the amount of energy we use, and that can be very good as well. Do you have any views on that? Uh -huh. uh, 
I didn't hear what you say, but perhaps it's Fred Scrap and Fossil is a young man. Subsidies. No, I didn't quite no. <laughs> get the question either. So but if you could please repeat it. Repeat it and I yes. I apologize. Would it be accelerate the arrival of the bioeconomy if the price of fossil, uh, if we sub reduce this subsidy on fossil fuel? Because that, I think, is holding down prices. Anyone, you heard the question? Repeat it then. I, I, I'm not sure, but I think it's about substitutes for, for, for fossil, for fossil energy and fossil fuels. If that can speed up fuels. the bioeconomy. Yeah. Aha, I see. <clears throat> And, if and how they substituting fossil fuel, can that speed up bioeconomy? If we take it away, the subsidies. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, for sure. I think mm -hmm. this is, uh, especially for the, for, for the member states of the European Union, as they are especially responsible and in charge for, for, for uh, the energy policies, uh, one, one of, the, of the major important issues, but not only fossil, also nuclear power. I think this is also uh, a second part of uh, um, uh, the, the energy production with it is not sustainable at all. <coughs> I, I think the question is uh, self-evident uh, in the answer that, of course, if we keep uh, pushing uh, public money into fossil energy and fuels, uh, you keep the other uh, sources, which are more domestic, so to say, or European, you keep them away. I, th I think it's self-explaining. Um, and there are calculations on how much we actually import on um, uh, fossil fuels to the European Union, what huge amounts we spend in supporting regimes and countries, which we well, don't want to go to because, because we don't want to support them, but we are dependent on resources they create. Some of that we could create ourselves through biomass, but I also want to underline that I don't want to politically say that we are going for 100% biofuels because there might be many different solutions in different parts of, of, the, of, uh, of the continent and working also on, on energy union matters. You can see that some parts we have huge scarcity of energy, in other parts we have a huge surplus of, of energy. And connecting the different resources we do have with the Iberian Peninsula, which has an overcapacity of electricity, but not being able to sell it up to the main continent, for example. And they have a large um, renewable-based uh, uh, energy sector also uh, in, the, uh, in the Iberian Peninsula. That's one way, and we cannot compete on that level of uh, solar panels and, and probably not even wind panels, uh, windmills, but we could uh, compete on other things. So that's why I, when we come down to calculating how to support the union on energy and, and uh, um, uh, oils for chemical products and plastics and so on, I think it gets a bit scary when we try to find one solution fits all, because that is not the true dimension of the European Union. But building on the diversity, then we can be really strong in saying that for our electricity production, what we're driving cars, in some countries it's totally uh, feasible to do it with renewables. In other countries it's probably much more sustainable to do it with electricity. And that's the, the, through to the diversity, the amount of sun and wind you have and, and uh, basic infrastructure. And if you don't have uh, a vivid and responsible uh, uh, bioeconomy already, it will take some time to actually get there in the end. And talking about supporting all of Portugal with biofuels today, domestically, that would not be sustainable, for example. My, my opinion is that uh, I think it is a waste of resources to use fibers for producing energy. It might be a bridge to the future, yes, but the long perspective, we will use it for much more advanced products, yes. and definitely so. And the second dimension, we have just started a process where we are increasing the efficiency in the use of energy. It is, it is a tremendous development ahead of us. It will go quickly. And uh, you can see it if you reflect upon the last 10 years, what already have happened, it will continue and it will increase in speed. So the energy issue, I think that is more or less uh, under, um, if not under control, so it's possible to solve. No, our biomass must be used for much more advanced purposes. That doesn't exclude that we, during a bridge period, is using it also for energy. That is my firm opinion. 
I am a forester myself. I have my own forest. I want to be, be well paid for that. And if I sell it for energy, I will not have anything in return. I want to sell it for advanced products. And if the traditional paper and pulp industry are prepared to pay for it, they are welcome. If not, you have the chemical industry around the ho uh, corner, of course. That is the future. Uh, and uh, let's not, not confuse that. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the major arguments when we are also discussing about uh, the um, um, cascading principle and how we could regulate. Uh, we have been with the Envy Committee to Finland uh, some some uh, month ago, and we <laughs> visited the Finnish Metsa, <laughs> and uh, more or less all the stages. And it yeah. was so clear that in practical, and especially in in member states where they have a, a, a huge use of, of forest and and wood and wood based products, uh, this uh, resource efficient system already works. We do not uh, need to regulate much more because, as you said, the forest owners, uh, uh, they really know how to deal with it and, and nobody would use their uh, fiber as a high quality product and of course well paid product uh, if they bring it uh, uh, to, to the right stage. Uh, they do not need uh, more regulation on this. Yeah. Professor Nice. <laughs> Thank you. I think uh, my uh, utopia story was not to plead for uh, some uh, kind of top-down uh, approach to, to get somewhere, but it was exactly uh, what also Göran Persson said, where do we want to land? And we do not want to land by wasting our nice uh, wood in just uh, burning it. It's inefficient, it's bad for our environment, and it can be some transition technology, but there's much better technologies uh, around uh, the corner. And so, uh, summarizing, uh, the future is uh, for a forest uh, where we uh, have part of it uh, available for other ecosystem services than the provisioning. That was uh, one part of, uh, important part of my story. Another important part was that uh, rather than using uh, uh, forests for energy, we will use forests for materials. So uh, the, the, the engineered wood and the big technology breakthrough is there that we can use very s uh, small diameters now to use, uh, to use for construction timber. So that would be in immense increase of use uh, of wood, um, and uh, also for biorefinery, for for, for produce, uh, producing consumables, uh, all kind of consumables uh, can be fine chemicals, uh, plastics, and so on, all from uh, from wood from uh, from a sustainable way. Th that's how our sustainable future uh, of the forest looks like. can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Uh, one comment on this energy question. Uh, I feel that both you, Joran, and Bart see this either or. You are using wood fibers either for energy or for wood products. Uh, the picture that I have in my slide try to communicate the issue that it's not a question either or. But usually if you are producing engineered wood products, the wood houses, you're producing residues which you can use for energy or so. So I don't see it as much either or, but uh, they go together. Thank you. Yes, that's, that's, that's very fine. Uh, but um, it's just kind of warning, let's not invest uh, in uh, using huge amounts of raw material uh, directly for energy. Energy can be a, a, a side uh, product of many uh, processes in the forest sector, uh, indeed, and uh, with technologies that avoid uh, those uh, contaminants, because that's another issue. Uh, the larger uh, you make those units, the more efficient they can be, and the better you can also filter the contaminants. Um, but uh, rather as, uh, as, as a side uh, product of what we can get from the forest. Thank you. Yes, this uh, one thing I want to mention is this: this forest bioeconomy is not only something of the the large forest countries. Because uh, two weeks ago, the Dutch uh, Prime Minister signed this uh, action plan, Forest and Wood, 
And of course, the Netherlands is this very famous forestry country <laughs> that we all know. <laughs> But it caught a lot of media attention because it, it was a really new way of thinking about forests in the Netherlands. Uh, what this action plan does is it, it's really developed with a lot of uh, organizations in the Netherlands, uh, both industry, NGOs, uh, science, etc. Um, we want to establish 100,000 hectares more forest. We want to better manage the forest. We want to build more with wood. So it's the whole chain. We want to do the capacity building amongst forest owners. So it's the whole chain, and that really got the attention. Uh, that's also why the, the prime minister signed it. So I think that it's 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 not only the, the big forest countries that, of course, they will they will probably lead in the forest bioeconomy, but also the small ones can play a role in this. Yeah, and I think it's important to say that even though you're not a big player today, it doesn't say that you within a generation won't be. And that's the whole thing. If we keep planting, we will have more to use in, in the future and also use sustainably. And one thing we haven't been mentioning yet is uh, Nanio Celalusa, the Wallenberg Foundation, <coughs> awarded, uh, was it in the spring, in February, I think, for, for their, their innovative prize for three Japanese uh, uh, of origin uh, uh, researchers that have found a factor minus 20. That means uh, cutting down to 5% of the energy needed to get out Nanio Celalusa, which is three time as, as strong as steel, which is lighter, and you can have it either transparent or not, so you can make unbreakable glass from it. Uh, you're able to uh, replace parts of, uh, 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 of an airplane to make it lighter, uh, so it will consume less uh, 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 fuels and so on and so forth. So we're just starting, and, and when researchers now are looking into pine trees, a pine tree is a huge chemical reservoir containing a lot of things we didn't even was, uh, think was there. If we, we were just using it for industry, paper and pulp, and not doing research on it. So what, what Jaron said is totally right. When, when it comes to chemicals, I do think that our forests will be able to provide us with things that we didn't even could imagine 10 years ago we could get from our forests. So there are many more solutions. but. If we now say that we should go in just one direction, it should be uh, harvested and managed in just one way, I think we will kill a lot of ideas and innovations. So that's why I said in the beginning, we need to open it because we're just scraping on the surface. We're still doing too much of low quality products. We can do it even much better, much more money, much more innovation, much more new jobs, especially in rural parts of, of, of the European continent. So there are many opportunities ahead of us. Last intervention from John, and then I will summarize. I, I think there's a plea there for uh, uh, what you could call bioeconomic diversity. And I think what uh, Professor Mouse is actually talking about, uh, and what Gordon Person has been saying, uh, it should not be underestimated. We, we, we know, certainly in the research innovation communities, we can see the trends in terms of what's happening out there. You know, biofuels will, largely speaking, be used by aviation. In, in, in probably in, in, in a, within a decade and electrification and other forms of renewables will have their way. And, and despite subsidies in, in different areas, these things have a way of working themselves out over time. I think one of the other important aspects when people are raising things about what technology is bringing to the potential of all of our bioeconomic resources, whether in the forests or in the fields, uh, in non-food areas, in the marine settings, I even in municipal waste and what we understand to be uh, um, biomass, um, there's a possibility here, whether you're a forest owner or you're living in a rural community or you're a citizen paying for your waste collection, for a kind of economic sovereignty to be returned to people if the model that rolls out is looking at all the possible options. So just to give you a clear example, now I know forest owners are very proud people and, and, and very independent in that, but if we look at the agri-food agri area, um, you know, the farming communities, I think, are beginning to wake up in Slovakia. We had a very important uh, declaration a couple of weeks ago that they can either just be people who hand over their biomass to different industries to do with what they want and let them add value, much in the way has happened with milk and various other things in the past, or they can actually realise that in these bioeconomic resources there is value which they could actually use to regenerate their communities and to build much more sustainable value close to the ground. So I think the importance of, of keeping, keeping our options open uh, and moving over time, I, I like the bridge uh, image that Goran Persson was giving, 
We are moving through time as well as space, so there will be things which will need to be done first and second and will have to evolve over time. But we need to develop our options, keep the knowledge and, and bring the different publics along because there are all kinds of incentives that may actually transform for the better, not just the way our biodiversity functions, but our economic diversity, which will be absolutely fundamental uh, both to the way in which we live in the European Union and to the return to that question at the very beginning about trust in the people who are actually making these economic uh, decisions for people. Thank you, John. Thank you, Madam Kostinger, Mr. Federley, and Professor Moyes for your contributions. Um, it has been an excellent, I think, exchange of views. Uh, we know a little bit more than before, and we realize this is not as easy as we perhaps thought it is. And um, that is also a good result of a seminar because the discussion continues. And uh, I think we will focus very much now from EF5, the think tank, on the narrative, how to describe the future with a bioeconomy dimension. What will that mean for ordinary people, societies, for the future, to open it, as Frederick Federley said. I think that is important. And there I'm afraid if we get stuck in uh, an old dimension of using the fibers, using the bioresources, for instance, burning them. That is a side stream, will be a side stream. The main new stream is something else. And that is something we need to be able to describe because without being able to describe it, we will never be trustworthy when we go asking for a mandate to design a policy. So it starts there. And if this seminar has been helpful in that respect, we are extremely grateful. And if not, we will have a new seminar in a short <laughs> period, I can assure you, because this is very important. Thank you for participating. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. Hello. Just on the behalf of uh, EFI, I would like to welcome everyone for the networking event. So there will be some wine and snacks on the uh, lobby. Thank you.